streams that I ran. Lovely.
Right, good morning all. It's uh, very nice to see you all. We've got eight logged in so far. That number might increase, but thank you to you eight loyal people who are watching. Nine now as I speak. Back down to eight. Anyway, it's nice to see whoever is here. Um, and this is now a new lesson, unlike yesterday. And let's hope it's not played with some of the technical difficulties of the last one. Hopefully the connection will remain. Um, well, we'll start in the usual way because it's a, a normal lesson. So I will give you three minutes of silence. The title, which is a little bit hard to see, perhaps, is Motors. Just the word Motors is the title. I'm going to put three minutes on the clock. In your books, please do the usual jobs. So update the contents, um, write a question about last time, as well as doing the title. Um, and I will stay still for three minutes, answering any questions if they come up. Um, and then we'll do our usual bits and pieces. So three minutes silence. If I can remember how to, there we go. Three minutes silence, usual jobs, then we'll make a start. Very touched, Terry, at your lightning speed paper round so that you didn't miss this. We're up to eight in the room now. Briefly, there's nine. There's someone who's very indecisive. I'm wondering if we're going to break double figures today. That doesn't matter as long as those who are here want to uh, learn some new physics. If you've just joined, we're up to nine now. If you've just joined, we're doing our three minute silence, doing the usual jobs where we write a title in our books, update our content, and write a question about last time. I'm going to start talking any second now. Um, thank you for your loyalty and thank you for your commitment, those who are here, especially when you might have got out of the habit, according to the comments at least. You might have got out of the habit of being up at this hour. It's really nice to see you all. Um, we're going to do some recap questions. I'm going to use the screen to do it. Um, I'm going to put some pictures on the screen uh, that are practice of Fleming's left hand rule. I'm hoping it's going to work a bit better than yesterday. Having said that, when I was just getting started with it yesterday, the connection failed. So it was about the time that happened. So I'm hoping this time, if we go through um, things on the board, and I'm going to zoom into the board so you can see what's on it. Um, we'll have a better experience of practicing Fleming's left hand rule. So I'm going to move some things around just quickly now. Just bear with me for a moment um, and then we'll do that.
Right, so I'm off screen now, and that's just to make sure that this screen is as big as possible. And I'm going to put up some pictures that we can apply Fleming's left hand rule to. What I'll do is ask questions, ask someone to solve it, basically. But I'll choose someone specific before we start all answering in the comments. So I'll choose someone specific, but then I'll ask everyone whether we agree or disagree with them. So you will have a chance to comment. So we have a magnet uh, with poles north, south. We have a wire passing vertically down between the poles of that magnet. And I'd like us to apply Fleming's left hand rule. I'm going to choose someone, hopefully they're in the room. We're now up to 10. Welcome if you just joined us. But I'm going to ask someone who I think is likely to be in the room um, and we'll give them a moment to answer. If they're not here or they can't answer, then I'll open it up. But Antonina, it's your question. So if you are in the room, what I need you to tell me is in what direction that wire will experience a force. I'll just give you a moment to answer. In what direction will that wire experience a force? Use Fleming's left hand rule to find out. Well, this could be someone not in or not able to answer. So I'm going to open up the question to anyone and everyone. So write your answer as quick as you can. In what direction will that piece of wire experience a force? I'll just wait for a few answers to come in. Thank you to those who have already responded or are responding. We have unanimity, we have agreement on that, on that answer, and every answer I've seen so far, absolutely right. It's quite a nice one. I don't have to move too much for this to work well with my left hand. Um, current is going downwards, so second finger pointing downwards. First finger representing the direction of the magnetic field, already in its right position, and that leaves my thumb pointing towards you guys, and as you say, out of the screen, outwards. Well done, I think I had in the end five answers to that, so well done. My next one is a different setup. Now, slightly less clear to see, but I also want to teach you about one important convention for us to understand. And I use the word convention quite deliberately because we talk in physics about conventional current. Conventional current is the direction that we say current flows. And what we say happens is that current flows out of the positive side of the battery, the large side of the battery. So when we look at this picture here, we see the current flowing anti-clockwise around that circuit. Conventional current tells you that it flows out of the positive side of the battery and into the negative. I'm going to ask the question in a moment, so don't answer yet. But I'm just going to pause on that fact. When you do A-level physics, you'll learn that actually everything I just told you is, is not true. It is not true that current flows this way. It actually flows from the negative to the positive. But all our rules about left hand rules and things like that were written in an age before we had discovered the electron. So they took a guess and they defined current as being something that flowed from positive to negative. And we still use that because it allows us to solve things like this. In some countries, they decided to, to reject that and to go with the new truth. So some countries teach the right hand rule, but we're using the left hand rule. And whenever you see a picture like this, then you look at the positive side of the battery, the large side of the battery, to know which way the current flows. So with all that said, I'm going to choose someone to answer the next question. And hopefully I'm going to choose someone who's in the room to give myself a good chance on picking up a number of different lolly sticks. And the first one I've come to, I definitely know is in the room, is James. Could you answer this one first? In what direction will that green piece of wire experience a force. We've got a north pole here, a south pole here. We know which direction the current flows, so in what direction will that wire experience a force?
James is going to open the page again. Um, just tell me if you agree, everyone else who is sort of following that. Do you agree with what James said? I'm going to go through it in a minute, but do you agree or disagree? You've got agreement from Max, James. It's looking promising. We'll go through it. So let's see if you're right. Um, again, we apply the direction. These are very similar to what we went to last time. The current flowing that way. The field going north to south once again leaves the thumb pointing out of the screen. We'll just do two more of these. It is worth practicing these, but it's good to see that those who are participating seem to have a good handle on it. Uh, right, this is a situation quite like the one you saw me demonstrate. So we have a carbon rod on two rails that are made of brass. We have a battery, so there's a circuit pictured here. And if you see, the battery has, I'm just gonna walk to this side of the screen. The battery has its positive terminal here. It's positive terminals here, it's negative terminals here. And we have a north side of a magnet here and a south side of a magnet here. That should be enough information for us to know in what direction that carbon rod will roll. And I'm going to ask someone else, again, hopefully someone in the room. Harry. You've gone for outwards again and you ended it with a question mark as if you weren't sure. Again, I'm going to ask the room if they agree or disagree. It is hard from the distance you're working at and it's not the clearest diagram. Uh, let's see if we have agreement or disagreement with your conclusion that it's outwards again. Two people disagreeing, and, and part of this could be the, the interpretation of what is a, a three-dimensional system projected onto a two-dimensional diagram. It's always hard to, to sort of see that, especially when you're looking at it from the distance you are on a screen that might not be very clear. Um, but three people actually saying to the right, let's apply the rule again. A little bit more twisting around required. The current then is coming from the positive side along here. Now that's meant to represent out of the page. That's the thing that could be confusing. So this second finger is pointing out of the page and that is leaving my thumb absolutely pointing to the right. So well done those who corrected. Um, it is right in this case. And we're going to do one more, just one more of these. Um, and again, this final one is a, a three-dimensional representation of a system. So I'm not going to say much to help you here. You can see the picture of the battery. We'll assume the circuit's closed. There's no trick question here. So let's imagine the circuit's closed and there is a current flowing. And you can see the poles of a magnet there. That should be enough information for you to tell me what direction this bit of wire will experience a force. Um, and again, I'll... No, I'll ask you all to answer. So this time, as soon as you think you know an answer, put an answer up, we'll see if we have agreement. And I'll just give you a moment to answer. Got two answers so far, I'm just gonna wait for a couple more to see if we have agreement.
lot of people saying upwards, I'm going to check it myself. Um, so yes, we know from this picture that the current flow is coming out of the positive side of the battery, round like this. So we know that the current is coming out of the screen. Um, we also know that the field is north to south. And yes, when you align both of those things, you can see my thumb is pointing upwards. Absolutely, that wire would experience a force upwards. Now, I know I'm not getting answers from everyone because not everyone's choosing to use the live chat, but it's an encouraging sign from the three, four or five of you that are answering that you're doing really, really well. Fleming's left hand rule is something that people traditionally struggle with. Right, we're going to move on now and look at motors. So I'm going to, again, just move some things around, move the camera about a bit so that I can talk you through some things about motors. There's a series of demonstrations I'm going to show you, some of which you've seen before. We're just going to use the my way of recap, some of which are new to us. But I'm going to start with one that we've seen before. And again, I'm going to use the zoom feature, which I never thought about using till now, so that we can look at one thing at a time. First, a small bit of recap. So I'm just going to move the new thing out of the way for a moment. We're going to look at the rolling wire demo once again. So I'm just going to zoom into this one so that we can see a little bit more what's going on. Okay, uh, so You'll be familiar, hopefully, with this. It, it was a week or so ago, but hopefully still familiar with it. This was one of Faraday's first experiments that demonstrated this motor effect. He used a permanent magnet and an incomplete circuit that he completed with a rolling piece of wire, piece of copper wire. And when he switched the circuit on, he demonstrated that this piece of copper wire experienced a force, that it rolled. And I'll just do that now. And so he demonstrated the motor effect. He demonstrated that you could get a force out of a magnet and a permanent magnet interacting together. They create movement. Uh, sorry, a magnet, a permanent magnet and an electromagnet interacting together. And he also demonstrated that if you reverse the current, and I'll do that now, then the direction of the force would to get rotary motion, not just a one way one time motion. When I do this, it rolls, it rolls out of the field and then it can't move anymore. If I reverse the current again, it will roll and it will roll in the opposite direction. But it's a one time thing. It isn't constant motion. Conceivably, it's useful. There might be uses of that. But what the race was on now was to find something called rotary motion. Now, I'm going to show you how he solved that. I'm going to show it as a GIF on the screen. I just don't have the equipment to hand for it. It requires some mercury. And that's not the kind of thing that's easy to get your hands on anymore because we now know mercury to be poisonous. But I'm going to zoom into the screen and show you how Far Faraday solved this problem. So again, just zooming in, rather unflattering view of my head there, hello. I'll zoom in like that. And, in fact, I might have to zoom in further from the looks of things. No, we might be okay. So I'm hoping you can make this full screen for a moment if that helps you. 
But what he had was a pool, a dish full of mercury. He had a battery and he had a bit like before, an incomplete circuit or one that seems incomplete. So one of the wires goes up through here and then has this moving contact, this rigid piece of copper, I assume. And that was just dipped into the mercury. He had a permanent magnet in the mercury as well. And then he had the second half of the circuit coming up to here and again just dipped into the mercury. Now mercury is the only metal that's liquid at room temperature. So this mercury can conduct electricity. So we did have a complete circuit. But what he was able to demonstrate to the world was rotary motion. If you see on the GIF, which is turning on and off, when this switch goes, it's going to move. This needle, this rod, rotated around the magnet. It spun around like that. He had demonstrated that this motor effect could be used to produce rotary motion, not just a rolling forwards or a rolling back, but a constant spinning motion. This experiment changed the world. Well, we're going to look at some examples now of actual motors and how they took this idea into what we now call a motor. So once again, a little bit of moving of the camera, but it will only take a minute. So we've seen that this rolling wire demo just produced a singular one-off motion in one direction or the other. Faraday then, by the experiment you just saw on the screen as a GIF, managed to produce a rotary motion. Well, you can imagine this set lots of people working on solutions on different ways that this rotary motion show it. It's worth re-showing now, which involves, on top of this blue tank, which is just all things in place, a permanent magnet, quite a strong permanent magnet, a battery, I'm going to use this knot here and oh, this knot here and I'm doing that just to make sure that the final wire that I put on doesn't slip off anywhere, doesn't fall off anywhere. making sure you can see all that as, as easily as possible. And yes, the final thing, a wire to make this into a circuit. And when you do that, you get rotary motion. The whole reason you get rotary motion is because the two different signals us why, and we'll show that in a minute. But this piece of wire feels a force that way. This piece of wire feels a force that way. And they rotate about a point. They create a moment, if we're going to use the proper terminology for it. They create a moment about that central point, and so you get rotary motion. And it's an impressive, simple demonstration of the motor effect causing rotary motion. But now I'm going to show you what actual motors seem to look like. And fair warning on this bit, there is a chance you'll see a grown man cry because it takes a long time to get this right. I practiced it for a while last night, it was working perfectly. So well, the first thing I'm going to do is deconstruct this motor and with that comes the risk it won't work again. And that's when you might see or at least hear me cry. But I'm going to bring into shot this. And I'm going to strip it away bit by bit so you can actually see what this motor is made from. This is a simple motor that we made at school. So I'm going to get rid of these magnets. They're just there to show you a direction of a magnetic field. I'm going to take this out as well. And I'm even going to take this motor off its axle so you can see the main parts of it. And I'll hold them up to the camera so that you can see what's what. I'm going to deconstruct this almost fully. Right. Now a motor starts with a coil of wire. I'm trying to show these in the right places on the screen and I'm just going to switch the camera's light on so that it's casting some direct light onto what I'm showing you. 
Right. I think that should help illuminate what we're seeing quite well. So you can see that I've just got a block of wood. Through that, we put an axle. We drilled a hole in the block of wood and we put an axle through it. So now this block of wood can spin fairly freely. Added to that, oh, it's not spinning as freely as it normally does. It's the first mistake. And then we cut a groove in the block of wood that allowed us to put lots of coils of wire around it. And you might be able to pick out, oh, and you can, the, the light's working quite well, I think. Two bare ends of wire here. They are gonna connect this coil of wire up to a circuit that's gonna put some current through this wire. And of course, whenever you put a current through a wire, you turn it into an electromagnet. So I'm now gonna mount this on its normal stand and then bring it back into shot. So now it's in its mounting, um, we've got something that can move relatively freely. And the other thing to draw your attention to is that those two bare bits of wire just brush against, these two bare bits of wire just brush against these two bits of brass that we've shaped so that they just touch. And it's these two bits of brass that are, are gonna allow us to connect to a wider circuit. I'll connect them in a minute there's one really important component of a motor and it's a permanent magnet. So what I've got here is two magnets and I've positioned them such that this one, this side of the magnet is making a north pole and this side of the magnet is making a south pole. So there's a magnetic field invisible to our eyes that exists between this magnet and this magnet. And I'm just gonna slip that underneath so that the whole motor is then inside that magnetic field. Well, all we need to do now is connect it, run a current through this, and we should see, when I hold things correctly, we should see that this motor begins to spin. And this is where I begin to get nervous that it simply won't work, but we're gonna give it a good go. So I take two wires, two crocodile clips, and connecting one onto the piece of brass there, and the other onto the piece of brass there. What you're gonna see me doing once I switch things on is I'm just gonna use two pieces of wood because wood is an insulator, just two lolly sticks to just press those contacts onto it and you should see the motor start to spin. Now that's the idea, we'll see how it works. So power going on there. And then as I press these together, I should make the two contacts and the motor should spin. You saw it spark then, and that's, a, that's something that happens often with this. But I should, with some persuasion, be able to make this spin. I'm just reaching around the camera, which makes it a bit more difficult. I'm gonna do one thing just to help my, my uh, cause. And one thing I'm gonna do to help my cause is just add to the strength of the magnetic field. So by doing that, I've increased the motor effect. I've just added on two more magnets, north here, south here, and they should increase the strength of the field and hopefully make it easier for me to get this motor spinning. Oh, there we go. I'm gonna do it again, but hopefully you saw that it spun at actually quite a rate. One side of it experienced a force in one direction and the other side of it experienced a force in the opposite direction and the whole thing rotated on its axle. Let's do that again. It's working really very well. 
So you saw one thing that I did to increase that motor effect. One thing I did was to add to that magnetic field, to strengthen the magnetic field, and it made the whole thing easier. The se second thing I could do, of course, is I could increase the voltage. What we should see is a faster spinning motor. I'm going to increase it from four volts to six. If I do it much more than that, actually, then the whole thing gets very hot and the wire starts to burn and you get sort of, sort of various problems with that. So six volts should still make us do a spinning motor. It may well trip out the power pack at this point, but we will see. And let's see if we get something that is spinning noticeably faster. If at all. Here's a lesson I'm quitting while you're ahead. You'll just see me now. I'm just going to try this before we move on. Just making sure those contact bits of wire are just in the right place, which I think they are now. I think we'll have more luck this time. Could be wrong. Power's back on. Wanted to go that time. And I think I'm going to stop that there because what's happening is the wire is now quite hot. So it's not exactly molten, but it's bending out of shape a bit more easily. So every time I try it, these little two bits of wire are just bending slightly out of shape. So to stop them getting any hotter, I'll turn that off. I may come back to that later. But yes, what you're seeing now is the motor effect or what you saw. And I hope that was a clear enough demonstration of how motors are built. Well, we're going to make some notes around that, then it's over to you to do some work, and that will be our lesson. So you will need um, one of the printouts. I'll show you which one in a minute. Um, you'll need a pen, and I think that's it. So grab a pen, grab your book, and grab your motor printout. Now, the one I'm talking about is that one. So just do that while I'm just readjusting the camera. And yeah, this is going into your books. So everything I do on a piece of paper here is what you will be doing in your book. A couple more changes I want to make to the camera and then I'll get to doing some notes with you. I think I'll keep the light on for a start because I think it's showing quite well. Um, I don't think a subheading is required in the sense that les the lesson was entitled Motors and we're about to write about motors. Uh, the first thing I'd like you to do though is take this printout and just stick it under wherever you've got to. Underneath that, we're going to write a few lines, a few separate lines. It will look big on my page because I'm using um, a felt tip, but in your case, it won't take up much room. So you'll maybe need six lines underneath if you're trying to decide whether to make a new page. But what I'm going to do is just stick this in. I'm going to ask a direct question and I'm going to ask Max. No, I'm going to ask Matthew because he's the last person in the comments. Um, Matthew, the wire at part B, will it experience a force up or down? The wire at part uh, label B, will it experience a force up or down?
Matthew says, Dan, Matthew's absolutely right. If you use Fleming's left-hand rule, you can see a direction of current labelled there. And that means that's this finger here. And it's pointing to the north. It should be pointing to the south. When I switch things around, that leaves my thumb pointing downwards. So we're going to label that um, where B is. So this part of the wire B will experience a force downwards. Just put an arrow like that. But then if we track the current around, so it flows through here, around the loop, and then back round, this part of the wire A will actually experience a force upwards. That is the key to this rotary motion. Well done, by the way, Matthew, on that, um, if I didn't say so. But yeah, that is the key to rotary motion, that the two sides of this coil experience the opposite force at the same time. So what we're going to do in bullet points is sort of describe how this motor works. So first bullet point, when a current flows, comma, the two sides of the coil And two sides of the coil experience a force. Full stop. When a current flows, the two sides of the coil experience a force. New bullet point. Um, these forces and I'll talk about them as if there are two. These forces these forces are in opposite directions. I'm now going to bring in the world of moments to this because these this whole thing, like you saw on mine, is rotating around an axle. Now, the axle's not labelled on here, but we can imagine some sort of axle around which this is all spinning. And so as soon as you have a force acting at a distance from a pivot, you have a moment. These two work together to create a, in this case, a clockwise moment. And that's what we're going to put. These forces, they create... A moment and I'm just going to put the reminder what moment means in physics so moment means turning effect close brackets so they create a moment brackets turning effect then I'm putting a dash in this case And in this case, as we look at it, it's clockwise. And now I think we just need to say one more thing, which is the motor spins. So that's how we get from Faraday's rolling wire demo to a spinning motor. There's one last thing to draw attention to on this, actually. And it's this thing called a split ring commutator. Now, a split ring commutator, look at it closely on your diagram. What's actually happening, because this ring is split in two, is this circuit is disconnecting and reconnecting every half turn. So every time it turns through half a circle, those two wires disconnect and reconnect the other way. Well, that is for one reason and one reason only. If they didn't, then the motor would flip-flop rather than spin. It would go like that. It would flip one way and then the other. Sorry, that's off your screen. It would flip-flop 
When this disconnects and reconnects, it ensures that the force continues to be in the correct direction, in this case, clockwise. Because if, if that didn't happen, then by the time this wire was over here, it would experience a force back the way it came uh, and it would flip flop the other way. So this splitting, this split ring commutator is there to ensure that the force is always in the correct direction. And I think that's worth adding. So the last thing we'll write is the split ring commutator ensures the motor continues to spin. Um, I think I'll keep it that simple, but the way it continues, uh, ensures it continues to spin is by reconnecting the circuit through the coil the other way around every half turn. So every half turn, this coil is reconnected. And that means that the current that was flowing through it in one direction actually flows through it in the opposite direction. But that means the forces work out as they're meant to, so that this motor continues to spin. I think you need to spend a bit of time with those facts to fully visualize them. Some of you will pick that up quickly. Some of you will just need to, perhaps in your own time, look at that and check that it makes sense to you. But that's how motors work. Uh, I'm going to adjust the camera in a moment, but I'll tell you what I'd like you to do next, and the, the last part of the lesson, in fact, is this second piece of paper. It has four boxes. It's not laid out like a, a normal question sheet might be. It has four boxes. And what I'd like you to do is just attempt to answer each of those boxes and then we'll go through the answer. So this one described the structure, keep it factual. Just say these bits, what is in that unlabeled motor? That involves a little bit of copying across from the diagram, but it's good practice. How could you make the motor spin faster? List three things. Um, explain how the split ring commutator works. The explain one's always more difficult questions and then explain how the motor works. Well, I'll give you 10 minutes and that will just give us time to go through it and we'll come out more or less on time in this lesson. And thank you for bearing with me if it just slightly overruns. So I'm going to start adjusting the camera, then I'll put 10 minutes on the clock and just in these 10 minutes, try and answer those questions. As always, if you have any questions to me, use this time to ask them too. That's absolutely fine. So moving the camera back round. I'm going to hover in the background here like with my timer. And 10 minutes, have a go at that sheet and then we'll go through it. Thank you for paying attention through all of that.
No, good question, Max, and a good point of clarification to make. No, the split ring commutator stays as it is, and the connections with um, with the motor just brush against it. But no, those split ring commutators do not spin. They stay exactly where they are. Just going up to halfway through your time. Um, I assume that things are going well. Ask anything if you need it clarifying. Um, but we'll go through the sheet in five minutes' time. Keep up the good work. Uh, in answer to your second question there, Max, um, both. So we're imagining on this picture, oh, I see why you're asking, sorry, no. No, just the coil of wire. Um, no, both, no, we can imagine both are spinning. So yeah, it's, it's unclear from the diagram, but they're both spinning. And the thing that is connecting it to the commutator, I think I can see where your question might be going. You'd imagine that staying still, but now that whole circular bit in the middle is rotating. And then two brushes either side, they don't look like brushes, but these goldy things um, are like brushes. They keep the contact going. They are the commutator here. Hope that makes some sense. Superb knowledge there, Harry. And you won't have to ask too many questions before I don't know the full answer to them in terms of things like how does a brushless motor work? 
Because what you can imagine is that the brushes themselves, depending on how they're built, they're a point of friction. They have to be, because you have to have these brushes of the commutator next to this circular spinning thing. They have to brush against it to transfer the electrical current. With that comes friction, and with friction comes heat and inefficiency. And it is no surprise then that motors get hot, as well as all the Ohm's law things going on inside the wire. The fact there's resistance inside the wire also creates heat. So you have the heat just from the current flowing in a coil of wire. You have the heat from the friction of the brushes. All of that adds to the inefficiency of the system. In terms of brushless motors, I'm going to have to confess some ignorance actually there. I don't know what they do instead. I'm sure a little bit of research in a moment, or perhaps after this lesson, I'll be able to get you an answer to that. I actually don't know what they do instead, but there has to be some sort of contact, and wherever there's a contact, there's some friction. It might be as simple as the shape is different, so rather than using a brush, there is a finer contact that nevertheless allows the electricity to transfer, the current to transfer, but doesn't create as much friction. I certainly can't think of any solution that wouldn't require physical contact, but I might be wrong. You have just over a minute left. So there we're done with the time, and I hope again that was an appropriate amount of time. Amount of time. I have three excellent questions through that, but the rest of you, I assume, were getting on with this and hopefully finding it okay. So we'll go through it. I'll then just make some closing remarks, and that'll be the lesson done. Um, as always, if you've got a purple pen, you can switch to purple. These systems matter less, I guess, when we're learning from home. If you've got a purple pen, use purple. If not, just add to what you've written as we go through it. Tick it off if you got it right. thing confusing me I'm trying to make it sort of square on I think I know what I need to do now something like that which a bit better on screen I'm going to switch the light of the camera on as well so that we get a nice clear view of what I'm doing right There is one last thing I want to show you really quickly, um, because you saw my simple motor before, and just thought I'd show you the inner workings of actually more complex the drill sort of motors you get inside drills, and you can see that actually there's a lot going. It's not just one coil; it's many coils in many different nets. Again, act in different directions. Um, so, yeah, the workings of this are more complex. 
and sorry, these aren't the magnets. This is just part of the whole thing. Magnets would have sat around this. But yeah, it is a slightly more complex affair when you start designing actual motors for different purposes. Well, we'll go through this now. So, top left box first. Describe the structure of a motor. As long as your answer mentions that it contains a permanent magnet, Make sure you uh, mention a permanent magnet. Make sure you also mention this idea of a coil of wire or a loop of wire. The idea that it requires some source of potential difference is the best way to put that. When we're delving into last year's work, to remind ourselves of that, but potential difference is voltage. Um, I guess we say that it spins on an axle. I think that's less important. I A X L E there. It spins on an axle. But we have to mention these commutators as well. This idea that it requires a split ring commutator. So well done if you got most of those. Add in any that you didn't get. How could you make the motor spin faster? And we have to identify three things. Well, you saw me do two of the three. The first thing you saw me do was increase the strength of the magnet. Increase, and I'll put it as the field strength. If you just put use a stronger magnet, absolutely fine, by the way. But yeah, we can increase the field strength of the magnet that we use. Um, we can increase the current. And the third one, I'm just checking as I go, there aren't any extra questions you're asking me there on. The third one we can appreciate from the thing I just showed you. The third one gives a bit of a hint that the more coils of wire we have, the bigger the effect we can gain. So the third thing to add here is increase number of coils. To increase the number of coils. So they're the three things you can do to increase the strength of this. Um, right, now to the explain ones. Well, we'll maybe go for the split ring commutator first. So you have to make sure that you get across this idea. It disconnects and reconnects. I think if you're wanting to be specific, I think it would be good to mention that it does so every half turn. Our notes it sends the current flowing through the coil in the opposite direction, but that ensures the force is in the correct direction. So um, doing so reverses current flow. Doing so re reverses current flow, but that ensures correct direction of force. Again, there may be detail you wish to add from what I've just said, and feel free to add that detail. Um, and then the last box, explain how the motor works. Well, it's essentially about what we wrote before. So um, we can say that a current flows in coil. Experiences a force. Important to say, I think, that that force is in opposite directions. I think the best answers here 
mention moments. I think it's a good way of sort of showing off with your physics. It's a good way of showing that you have a complete understanding. This creates a moment. So I hope you've mentioned that it creates a moment. And so the motor spins. And then the very best answers have to reference the role of the commutator. So the commutator Um, and again, we can say about how it disconnects and reconnects. But what that ensures is that the force is always in the right direction. So as long as you have most elements of that, then again, I think you've done a good answer there. Let me turn the camera back so I can say goodbye for now. And so I can just say about some arrangements as they come up. Need to make a couple more adjustments again. As a less than flattering view of me for a moment. There we go. Right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention through that. I'm just turning the light off as well. It's blinding me slightly. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I hope you found that clear. If you have any further questions about motors, please do ask them. I'm certainly going to look into how brushless motors work because that was a really, really good question. Um, in terms of what happens next, I'm in two minds um, and I kind of want your feedback on this, seeing as it looks like we have a sort of a core following of about 10 people. Um, it would be the Easter holidays next. Now, one of my sort of schools of thought says that actually we don't know when school will reopen. And I wouldn't want to have to go back to school and stop doing these before we'd finished the course. And there's still, like my guess, by the way, is there's still about five, maybe six lessons to do. We've not learned about something called the generator effect, which is a fascinating thing. We've not learned about something called transformers. And we've not looked at some other uses of motors that you might not have considered. So there's actually quite a lot I'd like to still cover. But, um, and it will take five or six lessons, but it is the Easter holidays. So we could take a two week break and then we'd have to have, I guess, three more weeks after that. So we'd be taking a chance. We'd be taking a chance that I won't be back working at school within the next five weeks. Now, I suspect, although I am guessing as everyone is, but I suspect I won't be back at school even three weeks after Easter. But I simply don't know. There could be a change in stance there could be a, ch a change in the facts that mean that this current coronavirus crisis changes in such a way that they decide it is good for teachers to be back teaching if that happens i'd have to stop these so that's been slightly long-winded but what i'd like you to do is this if you can if you've been a, a faithful watcher just email me at my school email address with your opinion should we carry on it would mean we did thursday and friday next week friday being good friday a bank holiday but bank holidays don't seem to mean very much right now because not many people are in work. Some are, not, not, not many, not, not as many as usual. And then we so we'd have Thursday and Friday next week, and that would mean we probably only need one more week after that, or maybe two, to complete this course. Um, so, yes, amongst my loyal watchers, the tenor also of you, if you have strong opinions, let me know. And if there's a strong feeling either way, we'll either continue to leave these lessons every Thursday and Friday for the next week or we'll take a two week break some of you might be well, I doubt you're going away but there might be reasons that you can't tune in in which case absolutely fine so as I say goodbye now yeah just remember to drop me an email giving your opinion on whether you want these to continue or not and if I've got consensus that I'll then email out as to what my decision is I am absolutely happy either way so for now, then once again, stay safe, have a lovely weekend, have a lovely rest of Friday, and I will see you on Thursday next week, if that's what we decide, and look for your emails either way to see that extra detail.
Take care and bye for now.